Hi, everybody. Welcome. Happy Wednesday. Um, welcome to True Crime Wednesday. I'm Lori Hellis, your host, and uh, I'm a retired criminal defense attorney, a criminal prosecutor as well, retired criminal attorney, um, and uh, author. And I've written a book about the Lori Vallow case, which you can see in the background. And uh, we have a bunch to talk about because opening statements started today in Chad Daybell's trial. So we have been waiting a year, almost to the day, since Lori Vallow tr Vallow's trial happened for this trial to finally get underway. And uh, as predicted, it is going to be a very different proceeding than Lori Vallow's case was. So um, we have a ton to talk about, but I wanna talk a little bit, I wanna do a little housekeeping first, talk about a few other things. And then we do have some other cases to talk about today too. So we've got a full, usually what I like to do is I like to sort of give my rundown and my impression on the cases. And then the second half of the show, we open it up for your questions. So if you would, please hold on to your questions until we ask for them. That way our mod Jen can grab your questions and uh, make sure that we mark them so that we can pull them up when uh, the question and answer period starts. So please hang on to your questions and uh, jot them in the comments. Uh, it helps if you put capital Q's or the red question mark emoji in front of them so that Jen can find them. So thank you. Um, we have a ton to talk about tonight. First of all, I want to give everybody an update on how the book is going. So I had a great meeting with my publicist, um, my the publicist who has been assigned to my book by my publisher. And uh, she's got some exciting things that we're working on. And uh, one of the big things that is coming up for me is I'm going to Crime Con. Now, for those of you who didn't know, there is a Crime Con. It is a true crime convention and it gets bigger every year. This will be the third year I've gone. First year was in Las Vegas, last year was in Orlando, and this year is in Nashville, Tennessee. I've never been to Nashville. I'm very excited about it. This year, we're going to have a booth so we can uh, so we can meet and greet people and feature the book. The book is available for pre-sales at this point, and will hit the shelves or your mailbox if you've ordered it online um, on September 3rd. So I have way more to talk about as we go along on that, but. While I'm at CrimeCon, I'm going to be um, signing book plates for anybody who shows me a, a confirmed pre-order of the book and meeting and greeting people, handing out stickers and swag, and uh, in general, getting to know a lot of folks that maybe I haven't met yet. So that's really exciting and I'm looking forward to it. My daughter's going to come down to Nashville from LA and join me and help out at the booth which is going to be super fun. I haven't seen her in a few months, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I saw her, actually, I saw her in March when we were all in Bend, Oregon, house shopping. So quick update on that. We have uh, bought a house in, in Bend, or in Redmond, actually, the, the uh, neighboring community. And our house in Boise, is our Meridian, is on the market. So we've been having lots of home showings. We've got an open house this weekend. We're keeping our fingers crossed for a quick sale. So anybody who, uh, who is uh, inclined, please send up some good vibes or some prayers or some good juju for a quick sale on our house. Um, <clears throat> and I want to go further and talk a little bit more about the book because we started the book launch team. This is a group of 100 people that we asked to come and sign up on a website and join us to um, help us promote the book. And what you get is you get an advanced PDF copy of the book that you'll get in early June. And then we're asking that once you've read the advanced copy, 
that you post a review about the book um, and uh, and on the major sites. So uh, Book Read, uh, Goodreads and um, uh, Book Hub and uh, Amazon, please. Um, because we know that if we get to the 60, um, to the 60 review mark, Amazon starts putting us into their um, advertising, um, you know, popping up the, the, popping us up in the algorithm. I'm going to spit this out if it kills me. Um, popping us up in the algorithm so that it begins to recommend it uh, to people uh, in their recommended for you file. So very excited about that. We have uh, a few more than 100 people who've signed up. So we've, we've closed the signups and uh, I'll be getting a, a, a more uh, current thank you out to everybody. The last time I sent out a thank you blast, um, we didn't have 100 people yet. So if you haven't received a thank you blast, it's coming. Um, the other thing that you will get access to is the Saturday Daybell wrap up that I'm going to begin doing. And that is going to be exclusively for the book launch team. So if you are part of the 100 people who have signed up, you will be getting a notification that we're going to go live on Saturday. The first one will be at three o'clock. Now, I purposely did that hoping that by changing the time a little bit, that it might be more convenient for people, especially on a Saturday. So 3 p.m. on the 13th will be our first um, YouTube uh, book launch live. That will be a private a uh, live stream for just the 100 people who have signed up through the launch team. It will be recorded so you can rewatch it if you aren't, if you aren't available uh, to watch it live. So there'll be some other little perks that are going to be coming out. Um, oh, and one of those things is I will be sending out to the launch team uh, autograph and personalized book plates so that when you do get your hard copy of the book, you can put it in there and you'll have an autograph copy. Um, for those of you who might be interested in going to CrimeCon, it is May 30th through June 1st. It is in Nashville, Tennessee. You can, you can find it online by Googling CrimeCon uh, or going to CrimeCon.com. And um, uh, it's my understanding that they're still looking for volunteers. So if you, if the price of admission is a little steep for you, you might want to look into volunteering because that gives you an entrance into the events and um, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Uh, it, it doesn't take up your whole day by any means. So, um, so think about that if you're thinking about going. Now, Daybell. So last week we did jury selection. And uh, all last week we worked on jury selection. And today we finally got opening statements. And um, so the jury was selected on Monday. The judge said Tuesday was going, oh no. Anyway. Today, they finally got to opening. That's right, today's Wednesday. I'm losing track of time. It's been kind of crazy around my house. Um, Tuesday, they took the day off. Today, we had opening statements. So they brought the jury in. They swore the jury in. The judge gave them their preliminary instructions. And then we were off to the races. The first thing that happened was Rob Wood gave his opening statement. Now, if you, if you listened to, because we couldn't watch, but uh, there are recordings out there of, Ra, of Lindsay Blake's opening in the Lori Vallow case, they were similar. Opening statements are sort of a roadmap for where you expect your case is going to go. And so, obviously, they were similar. Um, he did use the uh, money, uh, sex, money, and power uh, description that 
Lindsay used in Lori Ballow's case. But he used an interesting little hook. Um, he did it in, and he talked about Chad Daybell being a, um, being a, uh, a, I'm sorry, an author. And uh, so he talked about it in terms of chapters, chapter one, chapter two, which I thought was an interesting little device and may have stuck in the minds of the jury. He said, um, there are two dead children who were buried in the defendant's backyard. Very sort of uh, no nonsense and point blank. He said there, there is a wife who was de dead in her marital bed. And um, he really sort of laid out the story in a fairly edited way, kind of just laying out the guideposts and for, for where the case is going to go as, as the witnesses come and flesh out facts. So um, then we got to John Pryor's opening statement. And I thought this was probably much more interesting because this was stuff we hadn't heard before. John Pryor's, what we really got was John Pryor's theory of the case for the first time. Now, we've known um, that it was likely that um, we were going to see a very different theory of the case, a very different um, tenor and tone, um, but John Pryor really went after it pretty aggressively in his opening statement. He said, um, he described, I, I thought it was kind of humorous, he talked a little bit about Chad's faith and uh, made the comment that um, Chad and Tammy had an extended engagement uh, because they were engaged for six months before they got married. Um, he, he talked about the fact that Chad uh, uh, wrote about premonitions and about, um, and, but he definitely took the tactic that it's all Lori's fault. He really went hard on, she was the driving force, she was the femme fatale, he'd never, he'd never had anyone so, so attractive pay any attention to him. Um, and, and definitely by the end of opening statement, it was very evident that he was not only going to throw her under the bus, but he was going to back up several times. So I thought one of the most interesting things was chat was uh, that John Pryor said that th at least three of or four of Tammy and Chad's children are going to be called as witnesses to talk about her ongoing health problems and the fact that um, she had these existing medical conditions. So I thought that was sort of interesting. And then we got Detective Ray Hermosillo on the stand. Now we have seen Hermosillo on the stand two other times. And repeatedly being on the stand can be a blessing or a curse um, because memories change and we know that memories aren't, aren't static, that they change. And um, it, is, it is a, um, it, it, there's always a possibility that inaccuracies are gonna sneak in. So the more often you have a witness on the stand, the more dangerous it is for that witness to accidentally, or because memory isn't static, um, accidentally say something or, or um, counter uh, some earlier testimony uh, and contradict themselves. So. That's always concerning. Ray Hermosillo has been really the steady force in this case since the very beginning. He has been the lead detective on the case since the very beginning. And um, he, is a, he is a very good witness. So he's very practiced on the stand. He's a good witness. He's, he's very steady. He's very professional. 
And yet, there is always for him that little undercurrent of empathy, sadness, heartbreak for the children and for the victims. And so him, they starting out the case, uh, starting out Lori's testimony, it made sense because not only was he the lead detective, so he had the job of pulling it all together and being able to give you an overview of the case, but he also had that very visceral, gut-wrenching story to tell about how the children's bodies were found and how he was involved in that in that search. So he's very he he's he has that interesting mix of being very um, detail oriented and very professional and very polished on the stand, but also coming across as tender hearted and empathetic. So um, he's a great witness and and um, he's he's always kind of a hard act to follow. Um, <clears throat> So if they run true to what we've seen in the last two hearings, in Chad's preliminary hearing and then in Lori's trial, um, his testimony will probably last the better part of tomorrow. It's, uh, it will be uncertain whether he will get finished tomorrow. Now, the judge has decided to take the, to, to run the trial from eight in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon. That time from 3.30 to five is available for um, motion hearings if they're needed, for the court to take up other matters outside the, the presence of the jury, and to allow the attorneys a, a little bit of extra breathing time after court. Um, and I think that's going to be particularly needed for John Cryer. Um, as, as I've talked about before, and I, you know, being there now, I didn't get a ticket today. Uh, it finally, it probably worked out fine because I had a couple of other things on my schedule, but um, I was in there right at eight o'clock and I still didn't get a ticket. One of the folks um, who I've gotten to know here in the area said she didn't get a ticket for tomorrow either. I did, and I will be in court tomorrow. So, uh, but what was very interesting to me in, in watching what was going on was um, uh, when I was in the courtroom on Lori's case was how well received um, Hermosillo was on, uh, it, within the gallery and within the victims when he testified in Lori's case. Now there are some other issues that have come up and one of them is a real interesting one that we just don't know enough about yet. In true form, the judge has sealed most of these documents. So what we know is that on March 29th, there was a motion filed for a, a motion to intervene. Now, any of y'all who've been following me since the beginning know at one point, I filed a motion to intervene in the case for the purpose of getting sealed documents released. And um, a motion to intervene is sort of an unusual motion. Now, Idaho has a statute which says that um, people who are considered to be part of the media may file motions to intervene on, on in cases for the purpose of getting access to information. So I was on firm ground doing that, but it's very, very unusual to, um, to have a, a motion to intervene in a criminal case. They're much more common in civil cases. So it is a little strange. And this motion to intervene was a motion to intervene and a motion to postpone the trial. The interesting thing about this is we don't know the contents of the motion because that's sealed. The only thing we know is the contents of the judge's order to seal the motion. So 
Interestingly enough, the motion that was filed, the motion to intervene, has a bunch of typos in the in the uh, in the in the heading of the case. Um, motion has an e on the end of it, and, uh, and there's a bunch of there's like three typos just in the caption, which is odd. So we know that because they quote that in the order uh, to seal the documents. The other thing we know is that we know who filed the motion. And we know that because this person was listed as a person who uh, had to be served with the order to seal the motion. And that person is this guy. Um, he is a a longtime trial attorney from Mountain Home, which is a nearby community, a community close to Boise. And uh, he is the head of public defense services for his county. So this makes me wonder whether this is somebody who John Pryor was attempting to get on the case um, to help with the, the uh, to help with the case and, and someone who's death penalty qualified. But we don't know very much at all about this guy. Now, what I understood was that the judge was going to take up that motion uh, either yesterday or today. But so far, we haven't seen any orders show up in, in the, the uh, courts, in, in the court, uh, docket that would indicate that he has decided uh, the case. So uh, I am just, uh, I'm just pulling it up again, just to make sure that I haven't missed anything as we've been going through this. So um, as far as I know, at this point, the judge has not filed any, uh, any order about uh, Terry Ratcliffe's motion. So I'm just double checking while, so bear with me while I'm, in, I'm here. Um, since we don't know the true content, we can assume that he's, he's filing to intervene. The odd part about it is that if an attorney is appointed as, as counsel in a case, it does not require a motion to intervene. So that is the really strange part of, of the case. Um, that is the really odd part. Um, the last order in the case still is the uh, order to extend the non-dissemination order. So um, yesterday when, when they were in court, the, um, the, prosecution brought up the fact that they wanted the, um, the non-dissemination order, the gag order extended. So the judge entered this order after John Pryor did a fairly innocuous um, interview with a local TV station. And um, what we understand at this point from the order is that there were also me members of the media that were approaching and potentially harassing court staff, trying to get information that no one else was privy to. It may very well have been, had something to do with this Terry Ratcliffe motion, who knows? But um, what it meant was that um, they've extended that non-dissemination order throughout the trial. The original order that went into place last week um, was only ran until opening statements were completed. So the defense didn't object, in fact, joined with the, the prosecution in asking to extend the order, and so the judge did that. So it will be, it, it's very interesting because we don't know exactly who this Terry Ratcliffe is or why he has filed a motion to intervene. Filing a motion to intervene, as I say, is sort of an unusual way to try and get onto a case. 
because a motion to intervene makes you a party to the case. It's not really, uh, it wouldn't be the proper way to get appointed if you were trying to help out as an attorney on the case. And right now, all we can do is speculate because everything is sealed. So more to come on that, I hope. So tomorrow, the court will start at 8, end at 3.30, and the judge has already said there will be no court on Friday. Now, I don't know why that is. That may be because they're going to deal with Ratcliffe's motion. It may be because they're hoping to give the attorneys the opportunity to go home for the weekend. I don't know. I don't expect that the judge is going to adjourn and give everybody every Friday off. But I do think that there may be, there may also be some jurors who are still scrambling to try and get everything in order so that they can be there every day. So I think that's the reason why the judge decided not to go forward on Tuesday and to give everybody a day off on Tuesday. So after they seated the jury on Monday, they gave everybody Tuesday off. I think that was for the most part intended to give jurors, the, the 18 that were actually seated, the opportunity to get all of their arrangements in place with their employment, with their families, all of those things. So I don't think that we are going to see um, continued Fridays off um, because that that is would prolong this trial probably another week if if we're missing every Friday. So I wouldn't anticipate. I expect that this trial is going to go five days a week. And um, I, the judge could hold court over the weekends too. I don't think that he will, but I do think that he will hold to a pretty strict schedule um, of 8 to 3.30 on weekdays. Um, there, The jurors were asked about whether or not being sequestered would cause a hardship, because I believe under Idaho law, the jury must be sequestered during the penalty phase. So uh, that will be interesting to see how that goes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we know that Lori Vallow is scheduled to start uh, August 1st. Her trial is scheduled to start in uh, Maricopa County in, in Phoenix. And that, that trial will uh, addresses the issue of uh, Charles Vallow's death and the attempt on Brandon Boudreaux's life. So there's still a lot of moving pieces, a lot of things going on in this case. Um, it's been, I, I will say, in getting into the courthouse on, on Monday, um, that it was much less busy in the courthouse as a result of the live stream. Um, but I wasn't surprised that I couldn't get a ticket this morning because I sort of expected that a lot of people were going to want to be there for opening statements. So I think things in the with the ticket reservation will calm down as the trial goes on. I did get a ticket for tomorrow, and uh, we'll see how it goes on Monday. Uh, you have to, the way it works is you have to go on the website at 8.30 every morning and request a ticket. It's a little bit of a difficult time because court starts at 8, and so most people are driving and on the road and trying to get to court and waiting in line at the, at the metal detector um, when they have to be um, uh, getting on the ticketing website, on the, the ticketing site. However, um, thanks to my husband, um, the, this is the way we worked it during Lori's trial, was he was the one who got on and got my tickets for me in the morning because I was usually already on the commute to the courthouse. So um, we, we'll continue to do that. He got my ticket for tomorrow, and um, I'm assuming that we'll be doing that as we go forward. Um, it is really difficult for um, some of the media people. I know Gigi McKelvey last time had a bit of a rough time because uh, Law and Crime Network wanted her to do a live before she went into the courthouse. And that was right during the time when she was trying to get her ticket as well. So 
um, it, it, it's not a simple process to get into the courthouse. Thankfully, uh, a lot of folks, I think, are going to be watching it on the live stream because it's way more convenient. You don't have to deal with parking. You don't have to deal with the courthouse and court security, and you can do it in your pajamas. So um, I expect there are a lot of people who attended most days last time who will be attending from home this time. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about a couple of other cases. One of those is, excuse me, it is firmly allergy season. Everything is blooming in, in uh, Boise these days. Um, one of the cases I wanted to talk about today is Dylan Round. Um, Dylan was a young man. He was 19. He was, um, had, had dreamt his whole life of being a farmer. And at 19, bought some acreage in a remote area and was working on trying to become a dry wheat farmer. And um, he ran afoul of a man who was squatting on the property. And um, the, the law enforcement has known for quite some time, uh, the, the man was charged and uh, law enforcement has known for quite some time that he was responsible for Dylan's death, but his body had not been found. And his body was found yesterday. So that is a good news for that case moving forward and for his family to have some closure um, to the extent that that's even possible. Um, I know that his family was very ardently and and um, frequently out searching. Uh, law enforcement said they had the assistance of a lot of local law enforcement and the FBI. And uh, so they have located his remains, which I'm sure is in some small part a relief for his family and certainly will help move the case along. Um, so a, a sad but not unexpected development in that case. Um, we also had sentencing in the Crumbly case. Um, Ethan Crumbly was the school shooter whose parents were prosecuted for providing him with the gun. And um, they were both found guilty. There were two trials. Um, I, I admit that after I watched nearly every day of Jennifer's, I um, didn't watch uh, uh, James's, the father's, because they were essentially the same case. And um, they were both found guilty. And yesterday, Monday, yesterday, I think, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll explain why the days are all running together for me in a minute. But um, the, uh, uh, the court sentenced them to 10 to 15 years, which I think everyone was a little surprised. Um, the judge very thoroughly went through her, her reasoning and um, came to the conclusion that she was going to, to, um, to sentence them to 10 to 15 years. Now, both of them had been in custody for a lengthy period of time, like three years. And they, she did give them credit for the time that they'd already served but they were each seeking to be released with, to be released with time served only. And uh, the judge didn't feel like that was an appropriate or adequate sentence for them. Um, she was um, definitely critical of both of them, definitely um, of the opinion that, um, that they were culpable um, and um, that they were, at a minimum, inattentive, negligent parents. So, um, and we've talked before about the fact that that really is a case of first impression. That is a case where we have not seen a similar prosecution um, prosecuting the parents for a child's heinous act. Um, I think this was a little bit of an outlier case because there were some ample 
um, indications that they under they should have understood that he the shooter had um, some pretty serious mental health problems and that they didn't do anything about it and then made it worse by giving him access to a firearm. So I suspect that um, we won't see similar prosecutions readily or we won't see them frequently. And I certainly expect that this is going to be a case that's going to go up on appeal and be on appeal for a very long time. Um, and I, I think the fact that they got long sentences pretty much guarantees that this case is going to continue to be um, appealed. One of the interesting little wrinkles to the case was that um, Jennifer Crumbly's attorney asked that she be released with time served and released on an ankle monitor and permitted to live in a guest house on her attorney's property. Now, in the nearly 30 years that I practice, I don't, I never asked that a client be released to my supervision. Um, a lot of times I didn't really want my clients to even know where I lived, let alone come and live with me. Um, so I, that's highly irregular and um, surprising. Um, the, the attorney is, she's a little unconventional anyway. And, uh, I think she genuinely believes in, in Jennifer Crumbly and genuinely believes that, um, the law in, in this case was, um, misapplied, I'd say, and, and genuinely believes that there is a route for appeal. So, um, you know, I, I, it isn't at all unusual for attorneys to become very fond of their clients. And you all have heard me talk uh, and, and talk about my friend Nancy, who started out as, as a, uh, an accessory to an armed robbery. I represented her. She went to prison. And uh, she and I have remained friends, and she has made amazing strides in her life. She now heads an organization that finds uh, jobs and, and job placement for people coming out of prison because she discovered there were so many barriers to her being able to work uh, once she was released from prison. So. Um, she um, has done amazing, amazing work uh, within her community and continues to do that. So, um, but I, even at that, I, I would not have invited her to live with me. Um, I think it was more difficult when I was doing child welfare cases because there were certainly were, were cases where I thought, just give me the kid. Um, and there certainly were cases where I was tempted to act as a foster parent or, or to take kids in um, on a temporary basis. I never did, but there were times that I sure thought about it. Um, and, I, and I think it's more difficult when, um, when your clients are kids. Um, I can't say that I ever contemplated um, uh, one of my adult clients coming to live with me. Um, I, I can't say I ever contemplated even telling one of my adult clients where I lived or the kind of car I drew, drove, uh, let alone um, inviting them over. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, the the next case I want to talk about is um, Jesse Kurzins. Kerchevsky, Kerchevsky, I think is the way it's pronounced. That is the Visine case. And um, a lot of people, I, I didn't have time to listen to the, the complete uh, video of her statement, but she made some pretty interesting comments in her sentencing. Um, she certainly sounds an awful lot like. Um, like uh, Sarah, um, oh gosh, my, my, I just lost it. Uh, the woman who put her, zipped her fiance into a suitcase. 
um, I know you guys will correct me here in the in the boon. I, I knew somebody would put it in the chat. I kept thinking Brooks, and I knew that wasn't right. Boon, uh, Sarah Boon. She's the one who's been through many, many lawyers. I think she's on her seventh or eighth lawyer now, and um, and her trial date keeps getting pushed off because she keeps getting new lawyers. So. Um, I, I think that um, Jesse Kurchevsky sort of falls into the same category with Sarah Boone and with um, Taylor Shibusiness. Um, I think that there are some very troubled people out there and who um, end up doing themselves more harm than good by making statements to the court. So. Um, I am going to try to keep, to, um, keep up with the Karen Reed case when it starts uh, next week on the 16th. And um, I, I have been trying to catch at least some of the um, testimony in the Apple River case. That's a really interesting case. It is a case um, where the man claims self-defense, um, but it's a very sort of convoluted story. He's out rafting the river, a bunch of junk, drunk teens get into sort of a confrontation with him. And by the end, he ends up stabbing three people, one of whom died. So um, it's really interesting. I, I'm not sure with Daybell going on how much time I'm going to have to devote to that, particularly because I'm very interested in the Karen Reed case. Um, Karen Reed is the woman who is accused of having backed over and killed her fiance. It is a case out of um, uh, a, a suburb of Boston, and there is a great deal of um, many allegations about uh, police corruption, both in the Boston Police Department and in the um, uh, Canfield, I think, uh, Police Department uh, where John uh, O'Keefe lived. So John O'Keefe uh, lived with Karen Reed. They were longtime romantic partners. His uh, sister and brother-in-law had both died, and he was raising his young niece and nephew. Karen Reed was involved in helping raise those kids. And, um, <clears throat> and they went out on a January night, um, it, it went to a couple of different bars. Uh, everybody was highly intoxicated. They were invited to an after party. Karen Reed took John O'Keefe over to the party, dropped him off, but she said she was going home um, and left. Now, there's a lot of dispute about whether or not at that point that she backed up and either purposefully or accidentally hit John O'Keefe and um, injured him badly enough that he died of hypothermia outside the friend's house. There's also, uh, the other narrative is that he went inside the house, got into an argument and an altercation. They beat him up and threw him out in the snow to, uh, to die. There's a lot of conflicting evidence. And if you want a a really, really detailed breakdown of every bit of the evidence and all of the um, conflicting and questionable evidence and questionable practices of the police department, please, we have a link in our show notes to um, Brandy Churchwell's uh, uh, podcast. And she has done a many, multiple episode podcast, as well as many YouTube videos on, on the case. She is the person who started digging into the, the evidence and the timeline in the Murdoch case and came up with this incredibly detailed spreadsheet of of the evidence in the Murdoch case. So um, highly recommend 
that you take a look at Brandy's uh, site. Um, she has a lot of documents on her website that uh, you can link to and look at uh, in that case. And so um, I definitely recommend that you, uh, if, if Karen Reed and that whole case and the issues of corruption and all of those other things are interesting to you, please um, give Brandy a, a whirl. Um, the last case that I want to talk about is Koberger. Now, Co Brian Koberger is the defendant in the case. Uh, he's been accused of murdering four University of Idaho um, students in Moscow, Idaho. He has been um, in custody now for over a year. His attorneys are asking for his trial date to be set in the summer of 2025. However, no date has been set yet, and they are continuing to wrangle over stuff. I have to say that this was the first time, and I watched the hearing both um, a couple of late last week, I think, or, or uh, and today. And I have to say that the district attorney in this case is, I, I think he is really, really making this case more prolonged and more difficult than it has to be. Um, he, they started out when they did the um, genetic genealogy uh, analysis and the defense asked for the raw data and for the information that they used and wanted to pinpoint what sites they used. And they absolutely stonewalled the defense until the defense had to have a two day hearing on the issue, and bring in experts to talk about what the process and how you do genetic genealogy. And I mean, it was an incredible waste of time and resources. Uh, finally, the judge reviewed all of the evidence and signed an order requiring the bulk of that evidence to be turned over to the defense. Um, now we have this issue of a change of venue. So Ann Taylor, who is Koberger's attorney, filed a motion to change venue. Now you will remember in the Valor Daybell case, the attorneys in that case similarly filed a motion to change venue. That, that it was prior to, before, not John Pryor, but uh, it was before uh, Jim Archibald and John Thomas were appointed to the case. It was while Mark Means was still on the case. But John Pryor and Mark Means, John Pryor filed the motion. I think Mark Means joined in it. And um, <clears throat> They believe very clearly that um, that neither Chad nor Lori could get a fair trial in Fremont or Madison counties. So one of the things that they did was they did a survey. They performed a survey asking people to tell them what they'd heard about the case. It was a much less um, extensive or sophisticated survey. But because Fremont County was so small and because it was so obvious that they that that the media was that, that the potential jurors have been saturated with information that the judge ordered a change in venue with probably not as much in-depth uh, information as um, as Moscow has has required and so Ann Taylor got the state to pay to commission a survey and and there were there were several purposes for the survey first of all it was to identify how many people within uh, uh, what sort of percentage of people within the Moscow area had heard about the case how much they had heard and then to compare that with other counties, Ada County and one other county, um, <clears throat> to give the court some thing comparison. So one of the problems, one of the things that, that happened was the survey company started this survey 
And they asked a, a, a number of sort of graduated questions. So they asked some, some basic demographic questions. They asked the person whether or not they'd heard about the case. If the person said no, they were done. If they said yes, then they went on to ask some increasingly more detailed questions. And the final questions were quite specific. Um, did you read or hear anything about the fact that a knife sheath was found at the scene? Did you read or hear any news reports about, and then they asked uh, nine very specific questions. Well, somebody um, who uh, Scott Reich calls Karen, somebody out there called the, the prosecutor and said, do you realize that people are asking about this and this is going to taint the jury pool? So the prosecutor then got all up in arms, called Ann Taylor, Ann Taylor said, I am happy to, um, I am happy to discuss this and I'm happy to explain to you the reason why those detailed questions were necessary. And the next thing she knew, the, the DA in the case had filed a motion with the judge, filed it um, on an expedited basis, not permitted her to have any way to answer his motion. And the judge ordered that there would be a stay in, in and ordered them to cease the, the survey polling they've been doing. So the surveys, they'd made the 400 phone calls within Moscow that they were, that they wanted to do. However, they had not done any of the polling in any of the other counties that they wanted to use as a comparison. So now they have a half finished survey basically. And uh, so we've now had two hearings on this matter. And when I came on the air tonight, the Kohlberger hearing was still going on. So I don't know what the final analysis was, but they were questioning the survey, the expert who is, is um, conducting the survey. What I want to say is this is a very standard kind of process. Yes, it does have the potential for the 400 people who are surveyed of perhaps making them more aware of information than they might have already known. Um, however, it is critical to the process that they ask those questions. Here's the way it was described. Now, I want to say that I wasn't able to finish. I will finish, but wasn't able to finish before I came on tonight, the hearing the experts' explanations. But <clears throat> what he explained is, if you ask a person, have you heard about the Koberger case? Probably what they're going to say is, yeah, I've heard. How much have you heard? Well, just what was in the news. I mean, you know, just, just what I saw in the paper or what I heard on the local news. Okay. That does not get to the heart of whether or not they have heard prejudicial information. So those last specific questions, did you know there was a knife sheet? Did you hear that, um, that Brian Koberger was stalking one of the victims, which is not true? Did you hear uh, 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 about all of these other, these other issues, some of which were, were pulled directly from the probable cause affidavit, but many of which were pulled from the media? And the purpose of that is to get to the specifics. Because if you ask somebody an open-ended question, like, have you heard about the case? Do you know who Brian Koberger is? They're gonna say, yeah, I've heard. Well, do you, have you formed an opinion? No, I, I think I could be, I could be pretty, uh, I could be unbiased. But then when you start to ask, well, did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Did you form an opinion about whether or not that's true? Then you get to the point of someone saying, well, yeah, maybe I, maybe I have already made up my mind. Now, no question that it likely is going to impact the 400 people that they surveyed, but there was so much more important information to be gotten from the survey. And 
so much more important um, issues to be resolved with the results of the survey um, that I think it's worth taking a risk that those 400 people are not going to be available to sit on your jury. And that is the reasoning behind doing these surveys in the beginning. So what, I, what concerns me is that although this practice is very widely used in, in cases that are high visibility, high profile cases, the fact that this is coming into question in this case really makes Idaho look a little backward. And I think we have consistently seen with the Ballo and Daybell cases, as well as the Koberger case, the rest of the country looking at Idaho and thinking, oh, those rubes. And it's unfortunate because I think that it impacts whether or not defendants get a fair trial. Um, I think it impacts it from the standpoint of um, the rest of the country looking on and thinking, oh, well, you don't want to, you don't want to get arrested in Idaho because they don't, they don't really believe in the rule of law. Um, defendants don't get a fair shake there. And I think it's unfortunate because I do believe that the state of Idaho is doing its very best to protect due process rights. And I have concerns that these outlier cases are putting the state in a bad light. And that would be unfortunate because I think there are a lot of tremendously dedicated public servants on both sides, prosecution and defense. And I think that we, taking a look at the, at the Chad Day Bell jury, I think we've seen a panel of jurors who took their, their responsibility extremely seriously and were willing to serve on a jury. I, it was interesting when the judge finally, they went through all the pre, peremptory challenges. It is peremptory, not preemptory. Um, it bugs me every time I hear a newspaper reporter or a TV reporter say that say that, not newspaper, because they write it correctly. Um, <clears throat> but when they finished all the peremptory challenges and the, the bulk of the jurors, who, other than the 18 that were selected, were allowed to leave, there were a lot of big smiles as they were leaving. There were people who didn't necessarily want to spend the next 10 weeks of their life uh, on a jury but were willing to, to do their civic duty and, and took it seriously and responsibly. And I certainly think that is the case with the, with it absolutely was the case in Lori Vallow's jury. We, we heard from, from jurors after the case was over and uh, heard about how seriously they took their responsibility. And I definitely think that we're seeing uh, similar jurors in, in Chad's case. Um, so I will go back and finish listening to the Koberger hearing. The judge did say that he's not going to make a decision uh, today on it, that he wanted to give the, the prosecution a, a, an opportunity to file some written um, arguments so, and uh, to file the case law. So, that's where we are. And um, I think at this point, we will open it up for questions because I know that you all have a lot of questions about Daybell and about how things are going so far. So let's take a few questions. Please, while Jen is working on the questions, please like and, and subscribe. Um, subscribing is free doesn't cost anything. Hitting the thumbs up button really helps us with the algorithm. So please do both. Um, I always want to encourage people. I know some people are not uh, super comfortable with posting their questions in the chat. And oh, it's on this side. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there are also people who are not, uh, uh, who, who lurk in the background but have questions or we get we get busy and the chat runs fast and we don't get your, to your questions. If that is the case, please consider posting them in the comments or emailing me at info at the um, So please, 
feel free to send me those questions. Hi, Judy Gillespie. What do you think? Is there a possibility Pryor doesn't call all the kids just to keep them from the courtroom? Just subpoena so they don't didn't have to deal with the media. Well, that's an interesting idea. However, um, they are considered crime victims, and so they would be allowed to be in the courtroom during the trial if they chose to be, um, even if they're called as witnesses, because they do fall into that category. Now, we heard a bit about this in Lori's trial, because Kay and Larry were not considered um, fam immediate family members of victims. But um, immediate family members of victims uh, include the children, and they are Tammy's immediate family. So they would be allowed in the courtroom regardless of whether or not they've been subpoenaed to testify. Um, some other people would be uh, subject to the exclusionary rule and would have to wait outside the courtroom until they testified. But for the kids, um, it would be permitted. Now, um, uh, Lori's sister is in the courtroom. Uh, I'm sorry, Tammy's sister is in the courtroom. Samantha Gwillem is in the courtroom as Tammy's sort of official family, immediate family representative. But um, her children could be there as well. So I don't think that he, he's decided to call them just to keep them out or, or um, decided to call them for any other reason than I think he believes that they can come and testify about Tammy's health prior to her death because they are contending that Tammy's death was uh, natural causes and they are not, um, not conceding that uh, she was the victim of a homicide. So, good questions. Hi, Dawn. As far as I know, the book will be available on audiobook immediately. Um, the publisher decides who the, who the person is, the narrator is going to be. Um, sometimes they ask the author, but most of the time they use some voice talent that, that reads the book. Um, once the book, we're doing final edits right now, and the final um, PDF that will go to the printer to be printed will be available in early June. We'll have done all of the final edits and the copy editing and all of those things will have happened. At that point, then um, the PDF will be available to our book launch team and it also will be available for, um, for the creation of the audiobook. So it's going to be available in June. The book doesn't actually release until September. One of the reasons for that is to allow time to do that audio recording. So, but it will be available. So um, that was part of my agreement with Pegasus Books. Trisha the Trucker, how are you and where are you? Let us know in the chat where you are. Pryor is condescending and plays dumb sometimes. Is, th is this a distasteful tactic or just his personality? Hmm. I think it's a little of both. Um, I think that he does a little of the, uh, he, he definitely put on a little bit of the folksiness while he was talking to the jury, sort of um, friendliness. I won't say ingratiating, but definitely friendliness. And, um, uh, but I, I do think that defense attorneys tend to, and I think um, it's a mistake, I think that they tend to come off a, a bit condescending when they are cross-examining witnesses. I think it's easy to come across as, isn't it true? Didn't you say? To be confrontational and a, a little condescending. And um, I, I think it's a habit that we can get into. Um, I do think that John Pryor comes across as a 
man of his age and generation. People ask me about him, and my answer is always, he bears a strong um, resemblance to most of the white men who passed the bar in the late 70s or 80s. Um, and he reminds me an awful lot of many of the attorneys that I, I practiced among during my years of practice. Um, I, I, I think that makes me a little more thick skinned to his sort of theatrics and his, his, some of the things he says. Um, I think it's unfortunate he comes across as kind of, you know, a, a little condescending, a, a little, a, a, a little uh, misogynistic and, um, you know, kind of patronizing of women. And um, I think that's unfortunate. And I think that attorneys who have worked hard to eliminate those bias, biases from, um, from their conversations and their presentations in court um, fare better these days. Um, let's remember that millennials People who are in their 40-somethings are the folks who are more like, most likely to be on a jury these days. It isn't we boomers or uh, we folks that are in our um, uh, over 60. Uh, you're really looking at people who are in, in their 40s as sort of the, the, the demographic that we're looking at. And they're folks who don't really take kindly to those sorts of biases or those uh, um, of perceiving those kind of biases. So I think part of it is, um, it is his generation. And I think part of it is a little bit of a tactic. Um, and, and we'll see how he does going forward. I mean, we really only got opening statements today. Um, he hasn't done any cross of uh, Detective Hermosillo. It is all um, direct from the prosecution at this point. Now, I, I think I commented before, and I, I, I was looking at, um, I was watching him. I was watching the prosecution. They all look exhausted. And I will tell you, John Pryor looks like he's aged. He looks tired. And this is really the beginning of the marathon that this case is going to be. It is incredibly grueling to do a long trial, let alone to do a long trial without any help. Um, he does have an investigator who is there in the courtroom and who is, is sort of sitting on a bench behind him. But he doesn't have anyone except Chad sitting alongside of him, taking notes, bringing things to his attention, keeping track of exhibits. The things that we, two lawyers would tag team uh, for one another. Um, one would be doing that while the other's doing the questioning and, and they would trade off back and forth so that each lawyer has a gap of time that they're looking over their notes for the next witness and being able to double check and make sure that the exhibits that they're going to reference have already been admitted. Those sorts of things that are just the administrative part of running a trial. And he doesn't have anyone to do that. So he is having to do it on the fly and he's having to do it after he gets out of court in the afternoons and, and be ready again to get back to it the next day. It is absolutely grueling, and he will be very fortunate if he makes it through these 10 weeks without ending up being sick. Um, <clears throat> because it's a very public place, people are in and out all the time, and um, there are a lot of bodies in that courtroom, and, it is, and, and he is going to be exhausted and run down by the end of it. So um, it, it's rough, and I can't imagine trying to do it. I mean, let's remember the prosecution has a team of four attorneys. Last time in Lori Vallow's case, they had five. They had Rob Wood, Lindsey Blake, Tanya Rawlings, and the other fellow whose name I always have to look up that I can't remember. 
Um, one of them was an assistant in Rob Wood's office. The other was an assistant in Lindsey Blake's office. This time they have an uh, assistant attorney general. Uh, her name is Ingrid. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up in my notes. And, uh, and uh, a uh, assistant DA from Lindsey Blake's office. So they've got four lawyers in place and they're still scrambling. So it's going to be, it's going to be a long, difficult trial for everyone. Um, and certainly the added pressure of it being a death penalty case. Uh, you know, for every, for every objection, there is the potential, uh, uh, appeal potential. So, not only is John Pryor trying to watch and make sure that he's keeping track of what the witness is saying on the stand, but also looking at keeping track of any objections to any of the evidence and making sure that he's preserving those objections on the record for appeal. Uh, that is a, a critical part of, of any trial and particularly a death penalty trial. So it's going to be a long, grueling fight for him. Yes, I find him kind of condescending and a little on the annoying side. And I see that he is definitely a much more assertive and aggressive kind of lawyer than Lori's lawyers were. Um, but I also feel for him being in this position. Jay Gazmon, okay. Question, what is the deadline to get the paper crane patchwork square into you? There is not a deadline, we haven't set one. I would love to have them all into me by the end of the trial, simply because I'd like to be able to put them together and get them off to the fabulous Terry Goyens for um, long arm quilting. But, we are still doing the project. Please, um, you can uh, drop, you can get the information in our show notes. And because we have been getting our house ready to show, I um, don't have the, the finished squares uh, handy because they're put away. Um, so uh, I don't have them handy, but uh, I will definitely show them. We'll post some pictures. If you are part of the Good Lori Facebook group, we'll post pictures there as well. So please do consider the only requirement is that the squares finish at six inches and that you use a black background. Any colored fabric, any pattern is perfectly acceptable. So, and the plan is that when we finish those, we will assemble them. Terry will quilt them and we will gift that to, uh, to the Woodcocks in memory of JJ. In Japanese culture, people often fold a thousand cranes in memory of someone who has died. So it seemed particularly appropriate that we do a pattern that included origami cranes. So thank you for reminding me to mention that because it's important that we keep everybody thinking about that. Compassionate RM, what do you think about John Pryor questioning every detail of the prosecution's entering of evidence? I think that he is doing his job in a death penalty case. And the reason I say that is because every objection in order to preserve an objection for an appeal, you have to raise it at trial. So you can't go back at trial at, in, in an appeal and say, oh, that's a piece of evidence they didn't lay a foundation for and it shouldn't have come in, unless you have made that objection on the record at the trial level. So he is being very, very cautious to raise every possible objection. And that is not what happened in Lori's case. We saw a lot more um, stipulations. We saw a lot more um, no objection to the admission. Um, and it didn't surprise me at all that John Pryor is raising more evidentiary objections. 
Um, and I think that is simply to be expected in a death penalty case. I think you would see that regardless of who the, the uh, attorney is on uh, the defense. So um, it, it's certainly more important in a death penalty case. But I understand that it gets annoying. I mean, I get that you're just like, yes, okay, object. You want foundation? Yes, okay, I get, object. They, you know, did you, did you, were you there and did you see with your own eyes is what he's asked several times uh, of, of uh, Ray Hermosillo today. Um, and those are, are always good, uh, very good questions. So, um, I, they're annoying you. I don't recall. Question, would we know by now whether we made the launch team? So <clears throat> if you signed up uh, uh, before last uh, video, you probably got a, a, a welcome email. But I need to send out, now that everybody has been selected, I need to send out another welcome blast. So you should expect to get a welcome email tomorrow um, because uh, I'm gonna try and get that out tonight. If not, by the latest on Friday, because Friday's a day off from court. So you should expect to get a welcome uh, email saying thanks for joining my team. And um, you should, if you uh, signed up a, a little bit later, you probably didn't get the initial blast. But you will, I promise. Sorry, I'm kind of scratchy today from all of the pollen. Trisha, hi from Denver. Um, I heard, the, did I hear today that the weather was really good in Denver? Denver's one of those places that one day can be 80 degrees and can be snowing the next day in the spring. So hopefully you've had some good weather. And Trisha has a question. Do you think the kids prior are not putting on the stand or Emma and Garth because he doesn't want them cross-examined? I, uh, oh, uh, I, I don't really know. He's saying possibly three or four. Um, I suspect you will see Emma. Um, she has been a very staunch supporter of her dad, has, has certainly, towed the family line. Um, I wouldn't, I would be surprised if you saw Garth, although I, I don't know for sure. Um, Garth was the person who was um, in the ha house the night Tammy died. He, uh, Chad called him to help him, uh, to have him help Chad put Tammy back in bed because she had slid out of bed supposedly. And um, so, and he was called at the, at the grand jury level. It is possible because they are going to be talking about the details of surrounding uh, Tammy's death, that Garth may be called as prosecution witness um, because he was the only other person who was in the house. So it may be that the, the, that the one for sure that won't be called will be Garth because the prosecution is calling him. Um, I had heard a little rumbling that maybe not all of Chad's children were quite as supportive as, say, Emma, but I don't know for sure. I mean, I, these are rumors. We, we only have the information sort of swirling around out there. So I doubt that it is because they don't want Emma or Garth on the stand. Um, I think they're, I, I think you can, I would be very surprised if Emma's not, uh, not called. So, um, and you know, it is hard for me to fathom how I would feel if I were in their position. And I, I try really hard to sort of wrap my brain around how would I feel in that, in that position? And I, I think that it's, it's one of those situations that is absolutely inexplicable. Um, 
I don't, you know, there are certain, certain events in life that you can say, I'm sorry, and, but I, I can never really understand what you're going through. And I think what the Daybell kids are, are going through is one of those events. I don't think anyone uh, could ever understand what it is they're going through. And the position that they've put, been put in of, on one hand, the father that they've known and loved is accused of murdering their mother, who they adored. How do you ever wrap your mind around that? And how do you ever come to terms with that? Um, so I have tremendous sensitivity um, for the Daybell kids. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for them. I, I can't empathize. I can't ever imagine being put in that position, but I, I certainly have a lot of sympathy for them. Um, and I, I think life has been really unkind to them for the last uh, four years. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how they're going to react to testifying and I don't know how I would feel in their shoes. Being put in that position of having to support one parent over the other is always difficult, even more difficult when you're being required to believe something horrible, that your parent could be capable of something that horrible. So tough, tough questions. IgG rocks. What happens if Pryor gets sick during the trial? Well, it, it will cause a delay in the trial. There's no question about it. Um, if John Pryor is too sick to be able to come to court and function, um, it will cause a delay in the trial. There's no way around it. Um, even if the court, if the judge were to say, yeah, we're going to bring in a new lawyer, well, John Pryor's been on this case for four years. He's had four years to get ready for this trial. Um, to be able to bring somebody in at the last minute would be impossible. So if he gets sick, um, it certainly would cause a delay. And it could be a lengthy delay, depending on how serious it is. Um, you know, if he gets a bad cold or he gets a case of COVID, um, you know, it could delay the, the trial by days or weeks. Um, if it's something more serious, it could it could have a long time, uh, long term impact on the case. And those are things that are out of our control. I mean, they're out of the court's control at this point. The judge, you know, the judge can only manage what what is within his his grasp. And um, that's certainly not something that's in, within his grasp. So but it's a scary thought. It's a really scary thought. So, Rachel Camber, hi, Lori. What did you think of opening statements? I didn't hear a lot of positives from the internet people today, neither for Wood nor for Pryor. So um, I thought that Rob Wood was Rob Wood. Um, I wouldn't say that it was particularly animated or um, particularly moving or, uh, I mean, it was very uh, technician-like, um, which Rob Wood tends to be sort of uh, uh, workman-like. So uh, I think he, he gave a very similar opening statement to the one that Lindsey Blake gave in Lori's trial. Um, he did employ sort of a little, um, a, a, a little, maybe memory jogger in in putting it in terms of chapters in a book. Uh, so I thought that was clever, um, probably smart on his part to um, sort of lay that foundation. I think in closing, you will see them go back to that chapter one, chapter two uh, approach. And um, that's always smart to start, start and finish with a, a similar device. Um, I didn't. Um, I, I didn't find either one of them to have been barn burning. You won the case in opening statement kind of openings. It's very rare to see those. 
um, because it's like walking a tightrope. You can just as easily mess up your case as you can win your case in opening. Um, Over-promising, under-delivering, those are things that the jury remembers. Promising that you're going to prove X, Y, Z, and then when you get to closing, having not proven it are, are things that turn juries off. So I think there is a um, I think there is a tendency on the part of, of both prosecution and defense to stay workmanlike and to stay within the, the guardrails of, of opening statement um, so that you don't overcommit. I, I, and, and typically, if you're going to see more um, emotional sorts of uh, arguments, it's going to be in closing. Um, I think you're going to see uh, John Pryor pull out all the stops and pull out the fire and brimstone. And I think you're going to see the, the, the Baptist preacher style of closing argument. And that comes with its own set of dangers and risks. So I think it will be interesting to see how both of them go forward. Um, I would say that Rob Woods was exactly what I expected it to be, having seen Lindsay's uh, in opening in Lori Vallow's trial, and having seen enough of Rob Wood to see that he is very much um, a, a technician. Um, he, it's for him, it is a craft and not an art. Um, and so, and there is there is a difference. Uh, he he approaches it in a very methodical way, in a in in a way of um, it's very mechanical. He's the guy who's under the hood and and tinkering, and he's going to do it in a very prescribed fashion. So um, I I don't think I was really surprised about either one of them. I, I wouldn't say they were groundbreaking in any way. Uh, and, and I think that lawyers have to walk a bit of a line because this is the first opportunity that you've gotten to really talk to the jury about the case. You've met the jury, you've talked to them in, in voir dire, but you have not really had the opportunity to talk to the jury about the case yet. So it pays to be a little engaging. It pays to be a little, um, a little bit assertive. It, it pays to position yourself with the jury as the expert on the case. And um, I'm not really sure that either one of them did that in their opening statements. So um, they they both have got work to do to build credibility uh, with the jury. And they, but they've got plenty of time to do it because they've got a lot of witnesses and a lot of testimony to take and a lot of time. So that's a good question. Do juries see through the constant objections? Um, I would be annoyed by it. <laughs> I think they do. I think it's important to remember that the judge does instruct them that um, that it really that he's acting as an umpire and he's calling balls and strikes. And it's important that the evidence that comes in is the evidence that um, is relevant and the the evidence that is admissible and and that it is a process that does get tedious and does get annoying. And the judge generally gives them a, a caution that says the process of objecting shouldn't be held against either one of the lawyers. So understand that the lawyers have rules they have to follow, the rules of evidence. And within those rules of evidence, I'm the one who has to decide what comes in and what doesn't and, and under what circumstances. And so please, as you are hearing this, don't take it that um, 
an objection is held against one or the other. You're not, you're not to, um, if I sustain an objection, you're not to take that as anything personal against the lawyer who tried to offer the evidence. If I overrule an objection, you're not um, to take that as, um, as the objection was, was meaningless. So th there's some very specific admonitions that the court makes to keep people from drawing assumptions, uh, making assumptions based on those objections. But there's no question, it gets annoying. I was annoyed. I was annoyed listening to it today. And I know um, what it is that John Pryor is trying to do. I know that he's he's being overly cautious in making his record for appeal. Um, and I know what he's doing and I know the rules of evidence and I was still annoyed at times. Um, so I, 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 I have to say though, I get more annoyed with Judge Judge who belabors every single point in the Koberger case. Um, so I, I'm more annoyed with him than I am with Judge Boyce. And I will say, I am the first person to jump up and yell and be critical when people don't do good jobs. So I must also be willing to stand up and say when I think that people are doing a good job. And I will say that Judge Boyce had a very steep learning curve in this case, and he has not by any means always done everything right. But I do think that he did a good job in Lori Vallow's case, and I think he is following on by being very thorough in this case. Um, I guarantee that if he does things that I don't think are, are right or, or that he um, makes calls that I think are not the right call, you'll hear about it because I will tell you. But um, I also believe that, you, that it's important for you to hear from me the fair and the reasonable way of approaching it as well. So you, you need to hear from me when he's doing a good job. And so far, it's been doing okay. So you guys have a lot of good questions tonight. I think we're going to see, um, could we make a crane for Annie, Tylee's uh, uh, aunt? Um, I'm happy to do that if everybody is interested in doing that. Um, I think let's get this, uh, this first one done for Kay and Larry. And then if we have interest, I'd be happy to put together a quilt for, for uh, Annie as well. Um, so good question. Um, I, 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 people have asked me if I know anything about how Colby is doing, and I don't. Um, I think that he's in a really rough time in his life right now. and. Um, so I haven't heard much about what's going on with him. I don't expect him to be called as a witness this time. Um, his, his telephone call with Lori, his jail call with her was very important to her case and incredibly emotional and moving. Um, but I don't anticipate that that's going to be uh, introduced uh, as it applies to Chad. So. Um, but we are going to see Chad's children, and that could be every bit as emotional. So. Hi, tennis girl. Do I think the prosecution should call Garth? You know, here's the dilemma. I haven't seen the police reports. I haven't seen the discovery. I haven't seen Garth's statements about what happened that night. So I'm operating at the same disadvantage that you all are. I'm having to speculate and to draw from what I have seen in, the, in Lori's trial, from what I have seen in the media. And um, so it's a little bit hard for me to say whether I think the prosecution should call Garth. But I think it's possible that they may call him because he is the only other person who was present in the home that night, the night that Tammy died. Um, I don't know how much he's going to be able to add to the conversation about what happened that night, but it, it may be that the prosecution thinks it's necessary to be able to flush out the whole story. 
And, you know, sometimes the prosecution will call a witness simply because even if they think, well, this isn't necessarily going to add a lot to the narrative of what happened that night, but because jurors will ask, I wonder why they didn't call him. And so sometimes the prosecutor finds themselves in the position of calling a witness simply to remove the question that the jury might have had about why they didn't call him. So um, I'd say 50-50 that they call Garth, the prosecution calls Garth. Um, they may get some of the information in through the investigating officers who were there on the scene and were able to report what was said. But remember, some of that's going to come. It, they can report what Chad said because he's a defendant, but they can't necessarily report what Garth said. That would be hearsay. So, good questions, guys. Hot tennis girl, you're just brimming with questions tonight. Do you think Lindsay should do the closing? Um, if they follow the pattern, uh, that they did at Lori Ballow's. Um, Lindsay did the opening and Rob did the closing. Um, if they follow that pattern and have switched, we saw Rob do the, the uh, opening and we may very, I'd say it's very likely that we'll see Lindsay do the closing. Um, and to be honest, I didn't, I thought that, I didn't think that Rob Wood did a barn burning closing argument in Lori Bella's case. I thought that there were missed opportunities uh, in his closing. Um, so I, I maybe Lindsay will have a little bit more impassioned and a little bit more engaging closing. I don't know. Um, her opening wasn't particularly exciting in Lori's case, but opening statements tend to be a little bit more uh, middle of the road. So, um, but I, if I had to guess, I would say she's going to do the closing. And it sort of makes a little bit of sense in terms of the wrapping up because she is the lead counsel and, and the case is, uh, has been brought by Fremont County. So it would sort of make some sense and, and, add to the sort of symmetry of her giving the closing. Those are things I think about. I don't know. You know, you have to remember that district attorneys are elected officials and that that's that at least some of what they do um, appeals to their constituents. So I, I would never suggest that Lindsay Blake is is being political in the way that she is is prosecuting this case, but um, bringing the case to a close uh, with her doing the closing argument certainly would make sense from a political standpoint as well. Hi, BB. Do you think Pryor objects properly? Is it normal to question the witness during their objection? It's not. Oh, well, let me say this. Um, it is normal to do what's called a question in aid of objection, or as they have been calling it, a uh, voir dire. Um, because sometimes, and you saw it at least once in, in uh, today, when um, Pryor objected, he was objecting to the fact that Rob Wood hadn't done laid uh, enough of a foundation um, and so he asked uh, Detective Hermosillo a, a couple of questions, and then based on those questions, he withdrew the objection because Hermosillo was able to say, yes, I was there. I think it had to do with, with um, Pryor was asking about when you went through the garage and there were things in containers. Did who took them out of the containers and laid them out to be photographed? And did you see that happen? And initially, Rob Wood hadn't made that clear because somebody else took the pictures. So they were trying to lay the foundation for why Hermosillo knew that they were accurate depictions. And when he 
than when Pryor then asked her, Masia, were you there and did you see those items taken out of the containers? He said, yes. And Pryor said, well, then I withdraw the, the objection. So that's a question in aid of objection. And that is only done if you ask the court's permission. So you would hear Pryor say, Your Honor, can I ask the witness a question in aid of the objection or can I ask a question uh, in voir dire? Um, that's another way that the, the term voir dire is used. So um, that's pretty typical. I think what isn't typical, and we've seen John Pryor do, is that there is a formula for how you object. You say, objection, Your Honor, and then you tell the, the judge what it is that you are objecting to. Lack of foundation, uh, repetitive, uh, cumulative, hearsay. And, and John Pryor has a bad habit of, instead of saying, objection, Your Honor, relevance, objection, Your Honor, hearsay, objection, Your Honor, lack of foundation, which are all suitable objections. He says, Judge, can I get some foundation on this? Which is not an appropriate way to ask, to, to uh, raise an objection. And so he, he didn't, hasn't done it as often um, yet. We've only seen a, a couple of hours of, of Detective Hermosillo. Um, he hasn't done it as often as he did during the preliminary hearing, um, but he made a lot of foundation objections uh, in the preliminary hearing as well. So I, I think you're going to see more of those. And he certainly is within the procedural right to say to the court, can I ask the witness a question in aid of my objection? And uh, that is common. That's a typical practice. So what else do you have for me? Come on, bring it on. Compassionate RM. I read something about no chug. I, I, I think you're being a little disparaging of Chad. Um, uh, some people call him chubs. Some people call him, oh gosh, there's, there, there's, Mr. Potato, there's lots of things people call him. Uh, I read something about no Chad DNA on the tools that were used and had Tylee DNA on them. Do you think that's enough for reasonable doubt? I don't, actually. Um, I think that it is very possible that they wiped fingerprints and DNA off of those tools because where they found Tylee's DNA was actually in on the, the working part of the tool. So on the pickaxe, on the blade and the pick, they found Tylee's DNA. Um, so not surprising really, um, but I think, I think it implies that they wiped them off because these tools were in Chad Daybell's shed. And I guarantee if you walked into my laundry room and grabbed, and and tested the broom I use all the time, it would have my DNA on it. Um, it I also use it when I sweep up cat litter, so it would probably also have cat DNA on it, but it would have my DNA on it. So the fact that none of those tools had Chad's DNA on them suggests that they were wiped clean. And that probably is more telling than the lack of DNA. Um, than the fact that there wasn't DNA on it. Um, so I don't think that's reasonable doubt at all. I think the prosecution is going to argue that um, it, I'm sure that they're going to talk to DNA folks and the DNA folks are going to say things like, you know, if you had tools in your tool shed that you used around your yard all the time, would you expect to find uh, that person's DNA on them? Yes, I would. Well, um, what's one of the reasons why you might not find DNA? Well, if they were wiped off. So I think, I think the fact they didn't find um, Chad's DNA could easily be argued as um, consciousness of guilt and uh, covering up the, the crime. So, but that's a good question. Um, John Pryor said today in his opening statements that they 
um, that his DNA expert was going to come and address um, the many hairs that were found uh, in the in the masking tape or in the duct tape that JJ was uh, wrapped in. Um, and uh, so I think that will be interesting to see whether or not the DNA experts are really, uh, really do say what Chad says they say. Uh, he did make the point that the DNA expert that he's calling from, who is from here in Boise, I think he's a professor at Boise State, um, actually was part of the team that uh, was able to exonerate Amanda Knox. So that is interesting. He comes with some bona fides, as they say, a little street cred. So, um, yeah, I, I, as I've said all along, I do think that we are going to continue to see a really robust defense here. Um, is it going to be perfect? No. Um, but I think we are going to see a much more nuanced and more assertive defense than we saw in Lori's case. <clears throat> I think every place where there is an opportunity to poke a hole in, in, uh, in the prosecution's case, Pryor's going to be driving the bus through it. So. Um, and, you know, it's definitely something that I'm looking at as I watch the trial. How is the trial strategy different um, in this case than it was in Lori's? And uh, we know that Lori really took, uh, really tied her lawyer's hands. I mean, she would not let them blame Chad. She would not let them blame Alex. And she would not let them blame her mental illness. And um, those were really the only avenues they had. So, um, and as I've said all along, uh, I think Chad Daybell makes the argument that he was not directly involved in ending the children's lives. And I think that it's a much harder sell uh, when it comes to Tammy's death because he and Garth were the only people in the house. If the jury believes the coroner's reports, the autopsies, and believes that she did not die of natural causes, then they're going to find it very difficult to believe that Chad wasn't in some, some way involved. So um, I, I, think, I think we're just going to see a very, I think there is additional evidence that we have not seen yet particularly the evidence having to do with Chad's phone and his location, the location services on his phone. Um, so I do think we're gonna see evidence we haven't seen before, but I also think that we're just going to see a completely different um, complexion on this case. It's treat time in my house. My dogs just heard the thundering herd go by my office, so it must be cookie time. Hi, Jen. Do you think Lori is able to view or hear about Chad's trial, um, for example, tossing her under the bus? I think that she will have some access. I do not believe that she is going to have access that would allow her to watch every day. But I do think that her attorneys in Arizona are going to be watching. And I do think that they are going to be relaying to her the tenor of the trial, the, the temperature of the trial. So, yeah, I, I, she, she knows. I, I think she, I think her lawyers in Arizona were probably preparing her um, for the likelihood that he was going to, he was going to blame her. Um, and so I'm sure that her her Arizona attorneys are following and making sure that they're keeping her apprised of what's going on. Um, it only makes sense because they still have a pending trial and um, they're still preparing for a trial that at, has at least some of the same facts and the same evidence. Great questions tonight. <laughs> Um, we have about 10 more minutes, so if you've got any last questions, please 
drop them in the in the chat. Um, I, I did want to tell you that uh, each week I go through the chat and um, try and pull up any questions we've missed. I do uh, go through all your comments every week, usually the morning after with my coffee. Um, that won't be happening tomorrow because I'll be in court, but um, I also wanted to remind everybody that I am going to be trying to do some live tweeting from the courtroom. Uh, I didn't do that while we were finishing up jury and selection last week, or uh, on Monday, I mean, but I will be continuing to do that. I will be using my laptop and not my telephone because I don't want to be accused of holding my phone up where someone could say I'd taken a picture. If you know, you know. So, uh, but I will be taking my laptop and, and uh, doing some tweeting from the courtroom. So look for those. Um, my Twitter handle is my name, Lori Hellis, so you can't miss me. Um, ASW wants to know, could the lack of Chad's DNA on the Tylee tool items simply mean Chad's a useless excuse for a man? Um, it could very well. It could mean that he stood back and let someone else do the dirty work. Um, I think that at a minimum, um, just if you think about the timing of what was going on, I think at a minimum, Chad, <clears throat> um, the cemetery sextant dug JJ's grave. Um, I think at a minimum he did that. I think at a minimum he helped dispose of Tylee's remains. Beyond that, I think it's very difficult to say um, who actually put their hands on. But fortunately, it doesn't matter um, because the law says uh, that if you conspire, you're as guilty as the person who committed the crime. And in Idaho, that means conspiracy to commit murder is also death penalty eligible. That is not the case in Arizona. In Arizona, uh, conspiracy to commit murder uh, carries a uh, life sentence with a mandatory 25 years before you're eligible for parole. But you, they, you're not eligible for the death penalty for conspiracy in Arizona, which is why. Lori isn't facing the death penalty in Arizona because she is, uh, her charges in Charles's uh, murder and in um, the attempt on Brandon Boudreau are both conspiracy to commit murder charges. So don't forget uh, to download the crane pattern and make a, uh, an origami crane square six inches square uh, and uh, with a black background. And don't forget to like and subscribe uh, before you leave us tonight. And um, I will take one more question if there's one out there. Uh, otherwise, we'll get ready to wrap up and say good night. Oh, wristbands are still available. And if you have one of these little guys, please, 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 take a picture of it because, and post it in social media, whether it's on your Facebook channel, on my Twitter, on Instagram, wherever it is, because we really want to raise awareness uh, that the trial is going on and that justice is being served for Tylee and JJ. So I do have wristbands available. Uh, I'm gonna take uh, what I have left uh, to CrimeCon, and so I'm going to be handing those out at CrimeCon. Um, and, uh, but if you have, uh, would like to get a wristband, they are free. You send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and I send you back a wristband. Um, so it costs two stamps. So please, um, if you have one, please post, post, post. Um, I would love to see lots of people post pictures of their wristbands every day um, while this trial is going on so that we are keeping what's important in this case in front of everyone, and that's to remember the victims. Um, and uh, I appreciate you all being here. I know that there are lots of ways that you could spend your Wednesday night. 
For those of you all who are on the launch team, I will see you on Saturday for an hour long live at three o'clock on Saturday, the 13th. That'll be three o'clock Pacific time. And uh, we will uh, chat then about the week's events and what's what we expect to come up next week in the trial. And I will be back for a live next Wednesday. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks as always for being an amazing community, um, for being a community that is polite and respectful and fun and um, it, it making it a complete joy to be with you on Wednesday nights. Thank you to my moderator, Jen, um, for her support and her willingness to always jump in. And uh, we will see you, i to find the right button here. We will see you um, Saturday for the launch team and next week for another True Crime Wednesday Live. Good night.